My name is Bron, and on behalf of everyone at Better Red Than Dead, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom to celebrate the release of Growing Up, Dis in Dis Growing Up Disabled in Australia, uh, which happens to be our bestseller of the week at Better Red Than Dead. Please note that we have two Auslan interpreters present tonight, and if you wish to pin either of the interpreters throughout the evening, you can switch to the gallery view and you will see Kerry and Tyson there on the screen with the blue backgrounds. Alternatively, you can find them on the list of participants under Interpreter Tyson and Interpreter Kerry. Tonight's event is being recorded, so if you'd prefer not to be filmed, please turn off your camera settings. Before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. These will be different depending on where you're zooming in from. For me, it's the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that Better Red Than Dead is built. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have Nas Campanella as our moderator. Nas is the ABC's disabil disabilities affairs reporters and as we work worked as a newsreader, reporter and senior producer for Triple J and other ABC platforms. She has also undertaken projects with ABC International Development, running initiatives for people living with disability across the Pacific. Nas will be appearing in conversation with the editor of Growing Up Disabled in Australia, Carly Finlay, and contributor Elle Gibbs. We're honoured to have them all here tonight to celebrate the release of this fabulous book. Finally, before we get started, please note there'll be a Q&A session towards the end of tonight's event. You can type any questions you may have for Carly and Elle into the chat, and I'll share them um, to get answered via video once the time comes. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Nas to introduce Carly and Elle. Thank you so much, Bron, and thank you everyone for joining us here tonight for this very important launch of Growing Up Disabled in Australia. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the, all the lands in which we meet on tonight, and for me, that is also the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I too would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend a warm welcome to Indigenous people who may be on this call tonight, and those who live with disability. Tonight is a celebration. It's a night that has been long overdue. Many of us have been waiting for a book like this to come out. Tonight, we talk about stories, important stories that for some, they have felt uncomfortable to share until now, and may they never feel uncomfortable to share them again. I would like to introduce our two very important guests for tonight, who we will have the pleasure of having a bit of a, a chat to this evening. First of all, the editor, Carly Finlay, OAM. Carly is a writer and an appearance activist. She's the author of memoir, Say Hello, and has received an Order of Australia for her work in disability advocacy. Carly works part-time as Melbourne Fringe's Access and Inclusion Coordinator. She writes on disability and appearance diversity issues for news outlets, including CNN, the ABC, The Age, the Sydney Morning Herald and SBS. She was named as one of Australia's most influential women in the 2014 Australian Westpac Business Awards. Carly, I might start with you, if you could give us an audio description of yourself. Yes, hello. Um, I am coming to you from Wurundjeri country in the lands of the Kulin Nations and I too pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging, noting that Aboriginal people have been telling stories on this land since the beginning of time. I am a woman in her late 30s with a red face and short dark curly hair that's tied back. I am sitting in my kitchen. There is a white cupboard behind me. I also am wearing a um, rainbow print dress over a yellow top and a necklace which is like a house with lots of balloons on it. I put it on backwards before which I guess is the sign of COVID topsy turviness, but I've changed it now for you. I am at my kitchen table and I'll also be holding up a book at times, which is Growing Up Disabled in Australia. It has a really colourful cover with white text saying Growing Up Disabled in Australia. Thanks, Naz. 
Uh, I also forgot to do my audio description. Um, <laughs> how fitting that the person who um, is vision impaired out of the three of us uh, has forgotten to do so. Uh, I am a woman in her early 30s with dark brown shoulder length hair. Tonight it is up in a ponytail. Uh, I have um, fairly pale skin. I am wearing a scooped sort of neck um, top. It is black with a floral print and I am sitting in my living room. I'd now like to introduce one of the contributors to Growing Up Disabled and a friend and role model, Elle Gibbs. She is an award-winning writer with a focus on disability and social issues. Her work has been published by the ABC, The Guardian, Eureka Street, The Sydney Morning Herald, and many, many more. In 2020, she received the Leslie Hall Award for Lifetime Achievement in the National Disability Leadership Awards. Elle, could you please um, give us a description of yourself? Thanks, Naz, and thanks, Carly, and Better Red Than Dead. Um, and I'm coming to you tonight from the Wiradjuri, uh, lands of the Wiradjuri people in New South Wales. Um, and I'm a middle-aged woman uh, with white and blotchy pink skin. Um, I wear glasses and I've got reddy brown hair. It's a bit curly and a, and a ponytail. There's a bookcase behind me with lots of important books because I did that on purpose and a poster about disability uh, and resistance uh, in the background. And you can also see some windows in the background. Ali, let's start with you. Why this book? This book is well overdue, as, as you said, Naz. Um, I was asked to write for Maxine Bonaba Clark's book, Growing Up African in Australia in 2018. And on the same day that I said yes to that, I texted my agent, Jacinta Damaze, and said, can we please pitch this book to Black Ink? Because there's been lots of talk about the need for it. Every time a new Growing Up book was announced by Black Ink, Twitter would, um, you know, unite into or ignite into a discussion of the need for a growing up disabled book. So I pitched it and um, yeah, they said yes. And within a month of, of pitching, which is amazing. And it's been great to work with Kirsty and Sally and the team at Black Ink. Um, and it's also very important that we are in control of telling our own stories and that there is a dedicated book and, and space for us to do that. Um, I wrote in the intro that there used to be ramp up um, run by the ABC or hosted by the ABC uh, run by Stella Young who was an incredible disability activist uh, comedian writer um, girl about town and that was defunded in 2014 and it uh, we really lost a, a dedicated place for us to write and uh, communicate about disability um, and so while this doesn't replace that it's another addition to that. And I also want to um, give credit to Alice Wong, who is American, and she is an incredible activist, writer, um, producer, content producer. Um, and she has also just released the, sorry, the Disability Visibility Project, um, which is a book out with Penguin from America. So that is another important book. There are so many books that you can put on your bookshelves by disabled people, by the way. It's not like this is just the first one to happen. But this book, Growing Up Disabled in Australia, is the first of its kind in Australia and it's history making. So I'm pretty proud of that. Carly, can you tell us a little bit about the editing, commissioning and, and even the narrating of the book? Sure. So from the very start, from the very pitch that I wrote on my iPad, because that's where I do all my work, I actually wrote my whole memoir on my iPad. I do not recommend that with the amount of scrolling that's needed. Um, I had a note on the, on the pitch to say accessibility needs to be considered from the very start, from the very commissioning process. And so we have um, worked with, oh, I've worked with Black Ink to make sure accessibility has been a part of all steps of the process. So initially, uh, well, book, book publishing takes very long time. And so uh, the book uh, was signed off in, I think, August 2018, but we weren't allowed to tell anyone until December. So we had to wait all that time. I do remember sending Ben Law, uh, who edited Growing Up Queer in Australia, a very panicked text at about midnight saying, Ben, take your tweet down, because he tweeted that the, that, we, that I'd got a book deal well before it was meant to be announced. Um, so we worked with um, 
we worked to make sure that it was accessible for people to, sub to submit. So we made sure that people could submit in um, written form, audio form, Auslan video if they wanted. Um, and also there were a few people that I interviewed as well. Um, and then uh, that process was about six months, the submission process. And when I received all of the uh, submissions, there were 366 of them, I read them all. I made lots of notes and made a long list and then a short list. And then I looked at where there were gaps. So we didn't have a Paralympian. So I um, went to Paralympics Australia and I also realized I knew Isis Holt's parents through my old work. So I contacted them and said, do you think Isis might like to you know, be interviewed for this book? And she said, yes. Um, also I interviewed Jane Rosengrave who I had in mind for this um, from the start. Um, and I also asked Jordan Steele John if he could submit something as well. And there were a few, I think there might've been a few other people that I'd approached as well based on the writing I'd seen and there were gaps in there. And um, so we worked with the, um, with the contributors, with the successful contributors to um, edit their stories. And one of the things that was really important to me is working in the arts, working in the disability spaces. I know it's really hard to take um, rejection. So it was really important that the people who didn't get in the book were taken care of. So um, I would say that the letter that we sent out to the unsuccessful people, um, we took a lot more care in providing lots of support, lots of suggestions of where they could submit their work in the future and huge encouragement because, you know, if I had my way, I'd probably have a thousand page book, but we just couldn't do that. So um, I really want to see those writers who submitted, you know, um, flourish elsewhere. Um, and then after that, COVID hit. We expected the book to be out in June last year, but it uh, was put back. And that was, I guess that, you know, was a part of accessibility. It would have been silly of us to have um, a book out during a time when the world was so uncertain, when we couldn't have events. It takes a lot to sell a book. And as we've learned, online events are amazing events and we can still sell and um, talk. So that's great. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just a lot of waiting around last year to see what would happen. Uh, and then, yeah, it all happened really quickly at the end. I think I got an email from Kirsty at Black Ink to say the book's going to print in November. Um, and in the background of that, I've been working with the... Um, uh, with some organisations in getting funding to provide a contributor guide to contributors to help promote the book and to talk in the media. And also I've been working um, with you, Naz, and, and Al a little bit as well in um, providing a guideline for the media on reporting this book because I want it to be reported fair and I want um, the contributors to have a great experience because uh, sometimes disabled people get a really raw end of the deal when working with the media um, and in and in January while I was on holidays I got a call from my agent to ask if I could narrate the book initially Kate Hood who I know is on the line tonight on the zoom tonight was supposed to be narrating it she's an incredibly accomplished actor that you might know from um Prisoner and Neighbours. She's an ex exceptionally good um, book narrator. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to do it because of access reasons. Um, and so they asked me to do it, which was an enormous responsibility and, and one that I didn't take lightly. And it was an amazing experience. I feel very honoured to have done it because it was reading the book in a new way. I literally hung on to every word, but it was also a lot of work. So for a 10 hour book, um, it took about 35 hours. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. And, El, look, everyone's story is so different. Um, you know, there are 4.4 million Australians with disability in this country and every single one of us has a very different story to tell. But one thing that stood out for me with all these stories is everyone has experienced trauma in some form whether it be medical, whether it be um, through bullying at school or, or, you know, the notion of, of a teacher who was supposed to be supporting you, in fact, doing the complete opposite. Where do you sit with trauma? I think that's such an interesting observation, Naz, because it was one of the things that really struck me about the book as well. Um, we got our contributor copies a couple of weeks ago and I rang Carly not uh, long after I'd finished it and I said, God, Carly, everyone's had the terrible experience this is similar to mine and similar to other disabled people's. 
I think for many of us, um, you know, we come up against a world that isn't built for us and doesn't often make room for us. And so often coming up against the structures and the systems in that world can be really traumatic. Um, for me, my story was very much about um, engaging with the medical system and, and how that was a deeply awful experience over a long period of time. Um, and I think that uh, disabled people are, are fighting and have been fighting for you know decades now for a place in the world, not just for us as individuals, but for the structures and systems of our world. You know, the health system, the education system, work. You know, um, our love lives, all of that stuff, to actually not just make room for us, but to be about us. Um, and I think that this book is very much about, you know, disabled people writing stories of being very unapologetically saying, hey, we're here, this is what we need, this is where we belong. And, you know, keeping us separate, keeping us segregated is gone. Like that, that has to stop and that, that we've had enough of that. When you talk about things need to stop and we've had enough of that, let's talk about some of the inequities that I think, you know, when, when non-disabled people read this book, Elle, I think a lot of them are going to be thinking that Australia is quite a good place for someone with disability to grow up in. Um, and yet there are still so many inequities. And I see this through the coverage I do in my role as the disability affairs reporter at the ABC with the Royal Commission. We are hearing stories where there is such a huge gap in all aspects of life. Can you talk to some of that over your experience, both personally and also as an incredible advocate? Sure. Um, look, I think that, you know, nearly half of disabled people in Australia live in poverty. And that's a shocking statistic. We are some of the you know lowest in the OECD for the quality of life for disabled people. Um, you know, 40 plus percent of people on JobSeeker, you know, the old New Start are disabled people. Um, only just over 50 percent of us are working compared to 82 percent of non-disabled people. So there is these structural kind of discrimination and overt leaving us out of work and of any chance to participate in the economic life of Australia. And that shuts people out of an enormous other parts of, you know, um, having somewhere to live, um, you know, lots of disabled people don't finish school, don't go on to higher education. There is a lot of discrimination behind that and a lot of structures and systems in those education systems that just don't work. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, if we've heard some shocking statistics last year, I mean, uh, we heard a lot about how people with intellectual disability die 25 to 30 years younger than other uh, non-disabled people. I mean, that should shock Australia and say that something is deeply wrong, that that is happening. But I think that often, uh, you know, I mean, often disabled people aren't heard. And I really hope that this book is an opportunity for not just one disabled person, but lots of disabled people, you know, in every shape and size, you know, and with lots of different kinds of stories to really be heard because far too often, and, and Naz, you know, I've banged on about this to you more than <laughs> once, um, you know, non-disabled people think it's perfectly fine for them to tell our stories. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, parents and carers and service providers, they have a story to tell, but it's not our story. And I think it is absolutely vital that we get to have some control over what we do, what we say, and, you know, and actually, you know, pushing back really hard against the structures and systems that just aren't shifting. Like those job figures have not got any better in 20 years, and they're actually going backwards in some sectors. So, you know, for all of the, there was some, you know, benefits about COVID and the access that happened, you know, all of that access that we've been arguing for for all these years. I have been working from home on and off for 20 years, so it's not a new thing. Um, but all of a sudden, everything suddenly became accessible. I went to more cultural events last year than I've been to in about 15 years. Um, it was accessible. I could go to community things. I went to all sorts of things. And... Um, it showed really clearly that the barrier has never been about anything other than attitudes. Uh, it's not about cost. It's not about possibility. It's not about technology. It's about attitudes uh, and attitudes towards disabled people and whether we actually, people actually think we belong. And that's, you know, I mean, I know it's maybe a stark thing to say, but 
um, the, the statistics don't lie. And I think it's incredibly important that people understand that there is a lot of work to do about making Australia much more inclusive. Callie, you write a lot about attitudes and ableism and, and the social model of disability. Could you tease out for, for maybe people who are not familiar with, with the social model or ableism, what are they? Yeah, sure. Can I just add something to Elle's um, so it, yeah. as well? <laughs> One thing that I saw in editing the book, not just in the stories that we included, but in a lot of stories, was the fear of identifying as disabled. And I feel like, you know, when Elle talks about statistics not lying, that's very true. But it's also that people aren't aren't able to declare or disclose that they're disabled because they're scared or they don't have the language to do that or they don't know what the ramifications will be if they do. So I'm sure that the um, stats we're getting now um, are, are somewhat underreported in some areas. And, um, you know, in the book, there are a few people who go under a pseudonym and a few people who have asked not to be mentioned in the media because they, you know, there might be shame there. And I think the attitudes around disability, as Elle said, um, really need to change so that everybody feels comfortable in identifying however they want to and asking for the, um, the support that they need and information that they need. Um, so around the social model of disability. Um, so the social model of disability means that society has constructed the barriers. So for example, um, if there is a building without an accessible entrance or it doesn't have a lift be between stairs, that means that it might be ex in it or it will be inaccessible to people who are wheelchair users. If there's an event without an Auslan interpreter, um, then deaf people might not be able to access it if they are Auslan speakers. Um, attitudinal barriers include things like, you know, not letting people work from home, um, not having proper language, um, you know, different formats of information written, like things in easy English. Um, other attitudinal barriers include, you know, absolute systemic um, discrimination, you know, uh, like the segregated schools or segregated workplaces, for example. Um, I, uh, you know, compare, I think that Australia, I think Australia still in terms of the government sector and the medical sector still looks at disability from the medical model. And the medical model of disability says that our bodies are the problem and they should be fixed. But in fact, when we break down these barriers, our bodies are not the problem. The accessibility is the problem or the inaccessibility is the problem. You know, there's nothing wrong with our bodies. They never need fixing as um, Eliza Hull's amazing story was um, titled and also Elle um, talked about not needing fixing in her story as well. There is so much pressure on us to want to cure or want to change the way we look or the way our bodies work, but in effect, the world should change to accommodate us. And if anyone has a question, please feel free to, to pop it in the uh, chat field and we will be throwing to those questions a little later on in the conversation. You mentioned briefly COVID-19, Elle. Can you talk to us about your personal experience of COVID-19? I, I know you said there were some really great things in terms of being able to attend social events. And I know that I, in my coverage, have, have talked to people who have, you know, a woman who had been able to go to a music concert virtually for the first time in 20 years. Yep, that was that was very similar to me. I went to um, theatre events and concerts and stand up comedy and all sorts of amazing things from my bed. It was great. But look, I think COVID um, for me was a really uh, personally difficult. And then in the work that I was doing was also very difficult uh, at a systemic uh, national level. Um, so things changed very quickly. I had to go on lockdown. I went on lockdown two weeks before we all went on lockdown. I'm immunocompromised uh, and, and the rest. Um, so for me, getting COVID would be an absolute disaster. So I had to take a lot of precautions and like many other disabled people. Um, so I ended up not leaving my flat for four months and uh, things, the systems that I'd relied on to keep me going and, and helping me work and all of that stopped. So I couldn't get food, uh, my supports couldn't come. 
Uh, and about, I remember about six weeks in, I went, I've got to have a couple of days off work because I got to work out how I get food, you know, and all of that stuff. So um, I don't live in the city. And so trying to get access to all of that stuff was extremely difficult. And I have the advantage of having a job. And so I had money and I could, you know, pay for expensive groceries and weird things on the internet shopping and stuff like that. Uh, but I think for many people with disability, it was an extremely difficult time trying to find out what was going on. There was no information in accessible formats. There was no information at all about what was what any of this meant for people with disability. Um, many people um, had extraordinarily high expenses and so couldn't, and their support stopped coming. Um, so for people who don't know, supports are things like, so for me, it's someone who comes and helps me clean my house, helps me with shopping, uh, all of that kind of stuff. For other people, it could be personal care. That's what I mean by supports. Um, so that just sort of stopped. And it really wasn't until June or July, I think, until some of this stuff started to happen again. So people were left without resources for months at a time. And um, trying to get people to take the needs of our community seriously was very difficult and required a great deal of work and effort to get every level of government but also you know the community sector and the disability sector to take this stuff seriously and um, it's been really pleasing to see that in the latest round for the vaccines for example you know that people with disability are in the second tranche of vaccines which is such a relief for me um, I'm looking forward to getting that vaccine very much uh, and not being so quite so frightened of COVID all the time but I think that it showed that um, you know, the bushfires and then COVID of how incredibly important it's going to be for people with disability to be part of this kind of decision making about any kind of disasters. So, um, but one of the good things was I saw a great deal of people with disability getting together and helping each other. Like there were mutual aid groups uh, on Facebook set up. There were, uh, I know, very geographically local groups of people with disability who were sharing things, sharing PPE, personal protective equipment, masks, um, you know, essential kind of meds and uh, gear and that kind of stuff. So it was this really, um, you know, disabled people are really innovative and great problem solvers. So there was great to see us being able to help and support each other during that time. So um, I really do think that uh, disabled people really, you know, we're really good at this, this terrible things going wrong stuff. So uh, I reckon that uh, we should be in charge of emergency planning because I reckon we're pretty good at it. Carly, we heard a lot about non-disabled people feeling isolated and 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 feeling this sense of disconnect from friends and family and in many cases that was for the first time for many of those people mm. isolation is nothing new for the disabled community for, for some of us mm -hmm. talk to us about what you were hearing and and from some of your friends yeah. and, and colleagues yeah i i feel like I've been in Melbourne and it's just this roller coaster. Um, I've been lucky to be back in the office for three days this year and now we're back working from home because there's one case of COVID. Um, it's been it's been really isolating, I've I found for me, but, but for many other people, um, I think disabled people are already isolated. Um, and fortunately, the internet, social media brings us together. But um, for people who are homebound, who are bedbound, who haven't got the same access um, to the outside world as other people, um, you know, this might not have been anything new for them. But then for other people, like Elle said, if they lost their supports, that was very hard on them. Um, personally, for me, I had maintained my job throughout um, the whole year. Uh, from March, um, I well, I travelled a lot for my um, writing and speaking work. And the last event that I did was on the 8th of March, or actually almost the last event. But the last event I travelled for was on the 8th of March at the Opera House. And things were, pe people were taking COVID a little bit seriously, but not very seriously. And the Ruby Princess was docked right next to the Opera House as well. We had no idea what a debacle that would have been um, until after the fact. Um, but I do remember when I went on the plane, um, I was wearing a mask and no one was wearing a mask. And some guy said to me, have you got the Rona? And I just, it, I, it just didn't click. Like there were still those jokes that, you know, you must have Corona if you were um, 
wearing a mask. Um, one of the things that I have on my list of access needs when I travel is no shaking hands. And so I, I found that really hard to communicate to people because when I'd meet strangers at events, they would often try to shake my hands, but, you know, they weren't obviously communicated to, but I think now that we've got um, so many safety measures in place, this might be a thing for all of us, never, never to shake hands, um, never to hug with strangers. Um, I worked at home for from March to December. I had a couple of days out when I worked for the ABC and um, I did an Emerging Writers Festival thing, but other than that, I didn't didn't go out to work. And I, I found it really hard because my husband um, was working through a lot of the time bar about six weeks when all, all non-essential businesses shut. Um, and he could go out and he didn't understand that I was only seeing the chemist and the grocer for the times that I went out, you know, he was able to go out and see clients and, and, and go to a workplace. And I found that really hard. And I, the other thing I found hard was while Elle said she went to a heap of events, I work in the arts and I was working on many of those events and I did not want to see any event on Zoom. And I found that that hard. I don't feel like I participated um, online in as many events as I wanted to, but Having said that, I feel like so many artists have told me that they have now had a chance to participate in the arts when they weren't before. Um, I know at Melbourne Fringe, we gave away a lot of um, funding for artists and we had um, you know, lots of diverse artists who might not have been able to participate before, participate last year. And we also had lots of audience members who could take part. Um, it was quite easy, well, still at a cost, but I think it was easier for people to think about accessibility online last year. The artists that I talked to were very keen in making their shows accessible, mostly Auslan interpreted, but some captioned. And of course, if your house is wheelchair accessible, you know, the event is effectively wheelchair accessible as well, if you're watching it from your house. Um, so I, I feel like there was absolute benefit, but um, I think everyone has this different experience of what it was like. And personally, while my manager said I can work from home, uh, you know, for as long as I want to, I cannot wait to get back into the office to see people because I thrive on that. Question for either of you. I, I know being in the disability affairs round and, and obviously having lived experience of disability, I know a lot. And yet reading this book and, and every day meeting new people, there's so much I have to learn about disability. And it shouldn't be a surprise, obviously, um, because we're all so different. But what what have you learnt, I guess, by, for you, Carly, putting this book together and, and Elle perhaps um, reading it now? Yeah, I, I think that I've learnt that I associate with a lot of people um, who experience and live disability pride. So that is being proud of disability, being open about disability, seeing it as a part of our identity. And I would say that Elle and Naz are both of those people. And I had noticed that there are many people who are reluctant to associate disability with their identity um, or even name that they are disabled. And that's fine, you know, everyone has a different experience of, of doing disability. So I, I, I did learn that that not everyone is is as quick to say that they're disabled or, or talk about it or put their name to something. Um, the other thing I found was really interesting. I was born in um, 1981, which was the year of the International Year of the Disabled Person. Um, I think that looking at the people who were born before me and also after me, a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things have stayed the same. There's still so much inequity and discrimination and um, shame around it. And I, I remember narrating one of the pieces um, where the writer, it was Jess Newman Marshall, wrote about how um, she had to go to the toilet in McDonald's and the toilet was taken up with golf clubs. And the director, as we were narrating the book, um, were shocked at this and said, oh, I'm sure that wasn't very recent. And I said, no, Jess is only um, in her late 20s. So, um, yeah, she, she was really shocked to, to hear that. And I think, as you said before, non-disabled people are going to be shocked at that. Um, the other thing that I was um, really learning about, just about the, the variety of, of experiences, and I guess that comes into identity, but also that we have so many shared experiences. I definitely related a lot to Elle through her writing with having a skin condition, but um, 
you know, I related to a lot of the discrimination and trauma that was written about, even though it's I've experienced it in a different way. Elle? I think for me, uh, uh, two kind of things really stuck out for me about learning from other writers in there, which I learned an enormous amount. Um, but someone with segregation that, that was still, there are so many systems that disabled people experience at school, at work, you know, medical systems that are completely separate to non-disabled people. And that often, um, you know, they don't encounter non-disabled people in these kind of everyday parts of life. Um, and the other one was that for many people who were growing up uh, disabled, who became disabled when they were young, much younger than me, or born disabled, there's a lot of things are really confusing. <laughs> and um, as uh, some of the very wise disability justice activists have talked about, there's no disability doula, there's no helpful pamphlet that you get that explains a bunch of stuff about being disabled in Australia. There's no one who sort of says, this is quite normal, or uh, here's where you can go and get some help about this, or you don't have to go to a segregated school, or, you know, this is discrimination, or any of that kind of stuff. You, you There is nowhere you can go and find out this stuff. Um, and it can take a while to figure all of that out. Like it really, I had no idea that discrimination was discrimination. Like I didn't know, I just felt incredibly ashamed and like I'd done something wrong. And that that's a really quite common experience for young Young disabled people and my god goodness it really shouldn't be so i think that that stuff where you know if this book is acts as in any way that kind of pamphlet to sort of say you know you're not alone and you don't have to go through this and this is not okay and here's some places where you can go to get some help then that would be an amazing outcome We'll throw to some questions from the audience now um, we've got a question from mary ann what makes you think non-disabled people will care about this book? So Mary Ann says that um, she's always thought about how it, it would obviously mean a lot to disabled people, but but what about non-disabled? Um, I'll you, go, Carly. Um, <laughs> I, I read some of the other growing up, uh, growing up series in Australia when I'm not, you know, um, an Aboriginal person, an African person, um, and I read them to understand, uh, have some understanding about other people's lives that I really wanted to. So I really hope other people kind of bring that uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, good faith uh, to the book and are genuinely interested in learning about the lives of, of disabled people. Um, and, you know, look, I, I said to uh, Carly and some of the Black Ink people uh, earlier said there are, you know, 40 plus publicists uh, working on this book. Uh, so every contributor, I know that I have nagged every single one of my non-disabled friends a lot. <laughs> some of you are here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, uh, there are a lot of us kind of spreading the word as well. So look, I have faith that lots of people are going to read this book because I've seen the, the power of this series to really, you know, mm -hmm. highlight the experiences of different parts of the Australian community. And I really hope that's the same experience experience here yeah yeah I, I feel the same although it's funny working in the arts I'll, I'll talk to a non-disabled person about a disability arts events and and they'll say oh yeah I'll tell my disabled sibling and I'm like no it's it's for everybody it's for everyone so you know you don't have to be I mean I'd like to think that people are genuinely interested and, and curious and I think the sales this week have definitely shown that um you know where again to mention we're better read than dead's top seller this week which is amazing i mean above trent dalton and um bernadine evanisto who you know are both incredible writers um and also readings were on the number four spot there in melbourne so um i think that's amazing and it shows that people are very very keen for this book um this morning actually claire bowditch who's a, a friend of mine um an amazing musician and, and media presenter had shared it on her Instagram and so I think the word is definitely spreading. Mm. Elle, um, how important do you think this book is coming out during a Disability Royal Commission? Oh, I might, I might throw to Carly on that one actually sorry yeah, it was directed at Carly. <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> I think it's it is absolutely important I I don't um, I, I can't profess to be across the Royal Commission and I know Elle can't speak on it too much but I feel like a lot of the stories in here are the stories that the Royal Commission have heard so far. Um, there's one particular story that really stands out to me well there's a number of them but 
but in terms of an educational setting, um, Chantal Bongiovanni's um, story about going to a careers fair as a, a high school student and her, the very person who should be advocating for her um, has such low expectations of what her career should be. And I feel that, you know, we are hearing at every hearing of the Royal Commission these types of stories where the education system lets someone down, where the medical system or the legal system lets someone down. And so I feel that um, it is very important that we don't only read these stories but listen to the stories that are being told in the Royal Commission and take action accordingly because things need to change you know as Al said the employment statistics haven't changed for 20 years and I hope that we're not sitting here in another 20 years um, saying that the um, statistics still haven't changed since 2021. And what about a, a potential for a second volume Carly? <laughs> Look, it, seems so it, was, it was a question it's not a question of mine this has come from Bryony. <laughs> there has been a lot of requests for that and uh, I remember talking to Kirsty at Black Ink um, when we made the long list and I said you know what about having some of the stories that didn't make it on a website but of course there's that maintenance and the cost I'm not sure I would love it but I also would love someone else to take over the reins as editor um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is passing the mic on to people and making space for more people to um yeah be, be published and have opportunities um the one thing i would like to see is more opportunities for the um, contributors in this book and also other people to tell their stories i know coming from the growing up queer growing up african aboriginal and asian series um there's been um opportunities for other contributors to get book deals um I was speaking with one of the contributors from Growing Up African at Ubud Writers Festival and shortly after that, not sorry, not Ubud, um, Byron Writers Festival. And shortly after that, um, they got a book deal with Black Ink. So that's really exciting. And Eliza Hull also is writing, uh, is, is doing an anthology about parents and disability. Um, and so I really hope that publishers um, are more committed to taking on um, disabled people in their um, book deals, uh, also to, to give disabled people book deals. I also think that we need to be working in the publishing industry from the top down. From, um, I would say that this, um, that promoting this book has been a bit different to promoting Say Hello in, in that we do have so many people working on it, you know, the, the 46 publicists, as Elle said, um, but I feel like there is still a little bit of ignorance around accessibility um, and so if hopefully this can make booksellers, venues, um, publishers more aware of accessibility and the different types and the diverse types needed um, for future, uh, yeah, for future books. We have another question from the audience. Um, this one's from Sarah. Do the panel think the name disabled is an appropriate description given that the prefix dis has such negative connotations? Look, I, I'm happy to, to take that one on. Look, yeah. I'm a really proud disabled person and I am really, there's a, there's a, there's been a movement over the years called Say the Word. And, you know, there is a, a level for, for a lot of us who are trying to reclaim disabled and disability as not a bad thing. So I think for uh, many of us, um, we like being called disabled and being, you know, dis people with disability. Um, and I think that uh, there's, you know, I have a, you know, visceral reaction to lots of the, you know, euphemisms about disability. Um, and I think that part of disabled people coming out into our identities and into our power and into, um, you know, having an equal place in society is to, for us to be disabled and for that not to be something that we're ashamed of or we're forced to be ashamed of or that we feel like we have anything to apologise for. Like, I'm not apologetic about my access needs and I'm not apologetic about, you know, the, diff the things that make me different from other people, um, you know, and that make me disabled. So I mean, anyway, that's that's uh, I, I have feels about that. <laughs> yeah, and I I do too. And 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 just on the euphemism thing, to quote the late great Stella Young, she said, "Special is just another word for shit." <laughs> um, and I I think I, I concur with both of you. And I think you know, growing up, often it was oh, Kevin, that you know that that person's disabled, or you know, you, you were taught to almost fear it and and. 
feel embarrassed by it and that it was such a dirty word and 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 I too have absolutely no shame in in saying that I, also I, the title would have been very long and um yeah it wouldn't have been easy to roll at the time yeah and that's what it is we we are a, a community of 4.4 million Australians with disability and and um it's you know we're all most of some of us are very proud of that word um when we talk about the audience for this book, Elle, you and I have talked a little bit about who you want particularly to read this book. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Look, I, I think I was writing this often for, you know, the teenage me, which <clears throat> was quite some time ago now, uh, who was in hospital scared out of my wits and not really having any understanding of what was happening to me and not having the language to um, put what I was experiencing, you know, be about anything other than me being a failure and me being terrible. Um, and finding a way to understand disability in the social and political context was incredibly important for me to um, get to the point where being disabled is not something that I feel uh, bad about. Um, and that, that took a long time. It hasn't happened uh, in a short space of time. But um, I think that that wider context of disability where there's a community, there is a history, there are other people who have gone through these fights, there are other people who have fought these battles and have won, um, was incredibly important for me to know about. And um, so I wrote this to kind of say to anyone who was starting this process or in it, in the middle of it, um, that, you know, there is this, this sort of world out here uh, of other disabled people who have been through what you've been going through and, you know, can help you and, you know, kind of walk alongside you. It's, it's not something that you have to go through alone. We have another question from Catherine. Schools can be emancipating places, spaces, but are more often places that perpetuate social isolation for young people with disability. What should change to address this? Um, either of you, whoever wants to answer that. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't been to, a, to school for many years now, but I, I feel like when I hear stories from people with ichthyosis, the skin condition I have, for example, from children that are in schools, it seems sometimes things haven't changed around bullying and around the um, acceptance and, and consequences for bullies and, and the shame that are put on um, people who are disabled. Um, but I am seeing a little bit more support for, for children and, and um, young adults in schools, which is good around like, um, you know, disability plans, learning plans, um, you know, areas for people to um, administer their treatment, for example, and different ways of studying. So I think that that is a good thing. But I also worry about the um, issue of segregated schools, um, that people in segregated schools don't get the same educational opportunities, the same employment opportunities as, um, you know, people in mainstream schools. And one of the things that I do really worry about is the education around sex and sexual health, that the expectation for disabled people is so low that it's assumed that um, disabled people won't have sex or disabled people will be sexually abused, which is true of, um, you know, the statistics around abuse is horrible, but also let often disabled people aren't talked about, aren't talked, uh, taught rather um, around contraception or pleasure. So I think that that is a, a really important thing to change. And Elle, did you want to add, add anything um, around the schools and education just, for, just from what you've heard in your work over the years? Yeah, look, I think that the moves towards an integrated education are not happening fast enough. You know, it's 2021, we shouldn't have segregated schools. Um, and I think that um, there are this, this, you know, in a culture of low expectations um, for disabled kids. Um, and I think that it is incredibly important that you know, we get serious about making sure that, you know, all get all kids get a great education and get to go to the same school because there is a, a tendency for, you know, kids who go to special schools to end up kind of going into, you know, sheltered workshops, Australian disability enterprises, into, um, you know, supported employment, into, um, you know, group homes, into this entirely segregated 
way of uh, living their lives, you know, and there is no, absolutely no reason that that should happen. So I think that there needs to be far more work on um, kind of integrating, um, you know, education at all levels and making it accessible, but also getting, you know, doing some work around attitudes, but also around resources to make sure that, you know, um, you know, when kids are, you know, in mainstream education, they can actually have a structured and accessible learning environment. I think it's also really important to acknowledge that when you have that foundation, you know, school is foundation for so many of us. And when you have that foundation of everyone learning, playing together, that just stems off into all aspects of life, employment and study and, and relationships and all of that sort of thing. Absolutely. And I think um, just on that around the, the segregated schools, I feel like then that lead and the low expectations then leads into gatekeeping around who gets the opportunities. Um, working in the arts and, and even doing this book, I saw a lot of gatekeeping over non-disabled people deciding on whether um, a disabled person would be okay with doing this and you know uh, I just think that the, the lack of autonomy around that really needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a little bit about disability pride or a lot actually a lot about disability pride but there, there are obviously some some challenges that come with each of us with having disability, um, whether it be being sore one day and feeling great the next. And how do, do you both manage, you know, your, your pride with, I, I guess, the, the reality? I, I, it's something I will admit that I um, sometimes have struggled with over my 32 years. That's a, such a great question. Um, one of the things that um, really changed my life was reading a book called Pride, um, Against Prejudice by Drew, uh, Jenny Morris and um, Jenny was or is um, a disability activist really from an, in the 80s and 90s and this book was around finding pride despite that prejudice and the, the low expectations that people have um, particularly on disabled women and women rising above that and just realizing that yeah you know sometimes or a lot of the time having a body that is um, painful or is um, unable to do the things that you'd like to do is really difficult but also there is pride in that there's pride in difference and pride in having this unique identity and being involved in a community that's um you know mostly really supportive and innovative and caring and kind and um you know sometimes I don't want to look at my face in the mirror when I get up because it is infected and it's really sore but also um, you know, most days I am really happy to be who I am and, and happy to be um, not be knowing that I'm making a difference in, in the community, in both the disability community and the wider community. But it takes practice. There's a poem by Laura Hershey, You Get Proud by Practicing, which is a really great um, poem. I might um, Google it and put it in the um, chat for people to see. But I think that that is a really good thing, just, you know, take the practice, you know, practice pride. It, 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 it takes every day to do it. Elle? Oh, look, I'm really glad you mentioned the Laura Hershey poem because it is <laughs> it is an absolute cracker. Um, look, I think it's really important not to, um, the social model doesn't mean that I don't have impairments. Um, and so, um, you know, part of my impairments is that I have chronic, you know, fairly full on pain, but I also have what is called, like I have fatigue and what is coming to be called an energy impairment, which I really like that language. There's a chronic illness project in the UK that is doing some really nice work about chronic illness and the social model of disability. And, you know, um, no amount of access and ramps and lifts and all of that kind of stuff is going to change the days where I can't get out of bed. So um, I think it's really important, you know, for everyone to figure out how the social model works for you. Um, and there is quite a lot of really interesting writing and, you know, talking about the social model of disability and then about what comes next. So what's after the social model of disability? Um, and there's a growing movement in the US particularly, but also here in Australia, uh, about disability justice. Um, and disability justice takes a, a really interesting frame around this where impairments are kind of front and centre. Um, and so part of being, you know, disabled is, is actually being about your impairments. And um, some of, a slogan of that movement is that we move at the pace of the slowest. And I really like that because I think, um, 
in some in some conversations about disability, there is an expectation that um, you know we can be just like non-disabled people mm. and we can do all of these things. And I can't. You know, <laughs> there's lots of stuff that I just can't do. So um, and I'll never be able to do. It's not like it's gonna like there's some magic potion that's gonna come along and I'll some, somehow turn into a non-disabled person. It's just not gonna happen. So um, I think it's really important as we're talking about disability pride, that that also comes with being disabled, you know, and with everything that that means. So, um, you know, the awkward conversations with bosses about, you know, changing your work and, and you know, cancelling on your friends, kind of all of which I did last week, you know, because I'm too tired. And I think it's a really important um, thing to, to think through for every individual person you know, and for us not to try and not be disabled, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I just put a link to Julie McNamara's um, amazing lecture she gave at Melbourne University a couple of years ago. Julie is an arts practitioner from England and she talks about um, the question, what's wrong with slow and how we have to make things accessible to the slowest person in the room. And that is not a um, slur on people who do move slower. That is taking into account, um, like what Elle, Elle said about um, moving at the pace of the slowest and, and making sure that we include everyone. And, and you know, to, to second that, I think that there is the expectation that disabled people will do more than we can because we're always trying to prove our worth. And I know personally for me, I'm a chronic, chronically ill, but also chronically overachieving and overcommitting. And, you know, my mum takes, you know, tells me a lot to rest and I'm just not very good at that and constantly going. But, you know, I, I realise I have to because while I'm not going to become an Olympian, I never want to, um, I still have to measure my or, or ration my capacity in the things I can do. Um, we are about to wrap up, but I just want to ask one more question. It's also come from um, Jess in the audience. Very, very quickly, ladies. Um, uh, one lesson you'll take away from your role with this book. I'm sure there are many. <laughs> <laughs> um, that even a global pandemic cannot stop disabled people from rising to the top. Love I don't know whether that's a lesson or not. That's just <laughs> it's <laughs> how hard we work. And L. <laughs> Oh, mine is that um, while it feels terrifying to write a personal essay, it's actually uh, really important and I probably should do a bit more of it. Please do. <laughs> I, I beg you, please. Um, look, Growing Up Disabled it, uh, in Australia, it is out now. It is, as, as we've mentioned, Better Red Than Dead's um, bestseller. Make it the bestseller for a second week in a row. Please buy it, read it, listen to it, um, learn and, and pay respect to the incredible contributors and the incredible stories. Thank you so much, Carly Finlay and Elle Gibbs. Thank you.